So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, gives us Jesus' model prayer, a prayer I've been exhorting us and encouraging us to pray uh, and ask God to really shape our prayer lives with. So let me read it to you uh, one more time. And actually, why don't we read it together, even as a prayer? We'll start even with Jesus' command, pray then like this. Let's read together. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, would you come now and let your word speak deeply into our lives. We pray that you do this by the power of the Holy Spirit and with a demonstration of the Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning about food. And uh, food, as you know, has the power to shape us. Now, most of us don't need a detailed explanation of how food can shape us. I stand before you as one example of what food can do. We've been shaped by the food that we put into our mouths. And of course, food does more than just shape our bodies. Food is one of the most universal pleasures in life. Food touches the heart. One of the ways that God actually imparts his goodness and gladness and joy to human hearts is through the food we eat. Paul, when preaching the gospel in one of the first Christian sermons, says to uh, the people he's preaching to, God has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Most of the joy in this world that doesn't come explicitly from the gospel comes from food. And I, for one, am thankful for it. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. The things God made glorify Him. And pastor and theologian Paul David Tripp has remarked, it's amazing how much of the glory of God is edible. It's amazing how much of how God glorifies Himself is communicated through enchiladas and steak and potatoes. Amen. Now how we eat also shapes us. Multiple articles at the website Psychology Today, not a Christian magazine, tell us that children in families that eat together regularly with the TV off and the phones put away, these children are less likely to smoke, drink, do drugs, they experience less depression and anxiety than other children, and they tend to eat healthier. Before we default to medication to treat the depression and anxiety of our age, we ought to think seriously about what effect regular meals together might have on our souls. And if you're coming out of your own childhood going, how do I do things different? What an amazing thing just to make sure there's a time where the family is eating together and talking together. We're getting an illustration right now of some of the challenges that can happen to that time, <laughs> but it is worth the fight. So how we eat shapes us, what we eat shapes us, food shapes us. So it isn't surprising that Jesus wants his followers to pray daily about food. The fourth prayer request in the Lord's Prayer is give us this day our daily bread. And we're likely, if we've been discipled by the materialism of our age, to think the other three prayer requests were big stuff, spiritual stuff. Hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Can we have some food, please? But I assure you, there is no step down. We are not returning to spiritual kindergarten when we begin to think about food. Rather, when we begin to pray about food and notice God's answers to prayers about food, we're actually being discipled as deeply as a human being can be discipled because God is a God who communicates spiritual truths through material realities. He communicates his own glory through what he makes. He communicates his own joy through what we eat and the lessons to be learned in praying for food and receiving food are some of the deepest lessons you could ever learn in the Christian life. So it's not surprising that since food is such a big deal and we obsess about it so much that Jesus wants his followers to pray about food. And he wants us to pray most likely daily about food. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, when Jesus tells us to pray for daily bread, he is not advocating a carb-only diet. That would be a hard sell in this day and age. He's not telling the celiacs to eat gluten. The word bread here is really filling in for all of our material needs. Most basically, our need to eat the staple of life and be sustained day in and day out. The prayer is really very similar to the one we read in Proverbs chapter 30, verse eight, where the writer of Proverbs says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but feed me with the food that's needful for me. So here's the deal, food shapes us. It shapes our bodies, it shapes our attitudes, it it touches our mental health, our joy, our families, and not surprisingly then, Jesus wants the super influential part of our life to be prayed over. And here's what I wanna focus on this morning. If food is influential and shaping and transformative, Praying about food is even more influential and more shaping and more transformative. And you know, we spend our whole lives going, I need to get more spiritual disciplines in my life. True enough, probably true. But here's the thing, actually what you need to do is think differently and pray differently about what you are already doing. If you arrived here safely this morning, then sometime in the recent past, you've eaten. You're still going because you're going off the fuel God gave you through food. And I I hope you will be blown away as I have been thinking about the ways in which rethinking and re-praying over food can transform every dimension of our souls. And so I wanna focus on this morning how praying for your daily food will create in you humility, awe, contentment, gratitude, and generosity. Let's start with humility. It's pretty basic. I never met a Christian who wouldn't say they were proud. Never met a Christian who wouldn't say they needed to grow in humility. And it's interesting because what Jesus sets before us here in the Lord's Prayer is that every day we are supposed to go to God and admit to Him that we're in need. Give us this day our daily bread. And every time you pray that, you're taking a blow at the self-sufficiency that fulfills every one of our souls. We recognize when we think about this prayer, God's greatness. When we think about the fact that he actually can deliver daily bread. Think about it, it's only God, you can't do this. You can't create a seed that goes under dirt and then sticks out tender straws that suck nourishment out of the dirt and then push olives and peaches out of branches. It's beyond your pay grade. You're not able to do that. But God is able to do that. He can move 
tons of water over a field and not just dump it down so the whole field eroded, but to deliver it one drop at a time so that it actually pierces the ground and waters the earth and makes food for you. Only God can hang a ball of heat and light in the sky and have its beams impart light through the chlorophyll in the leaves of the littlest seedling. That's all beyond us. We can't do that. And that's why Psalm 104 says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth fruit from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's hearts. Only God can do that. And not only is God the only being who can do this, he is the only being who has never experienced reliance or dependence on someone else. When God made the world, he did not eat his Wheaties that morning to get himself psyched up for the big day. He simply, out of the effulgence of his glory, spoke light and cows and Asia, and there were light and cows and Asia. That's how God works. He he is like a fire that burns but is not consumed. He has no gas tank. There's no solar panels on the Almighty. There's nowhere where he turns to something else to get energy. All of the energy and strength and glory that created everything else comes from within himself, uncreated. And he can express that energy and dispense that energy and never does the, the tank go a little bit lower. He's always as full as he's ever been, even when he's creating, and if you will, pouring himself out. We, on the other hand, have needs. In the words of the philosopher Winnie the Pooh, we get rumbly in our tumbly. We get tired if we miss a meal. We get hangry if dinner is late. We get sick if we don't get our vitamins. We die if kept from daily bread for just a short period of time. We are dependent creatures. And the world we live in acts like we're totally independent creatures. We can make our own rules. We can do our own thing. And what Jesus is calling us to here in the Lord's Prayer is to get back in touch with reality one meal at a time. You know, it's often pointed out that folks in rural areas are a little more open to the idea of God because they're a little closer to the natural processes that rule the world. But it's foolish to think that you have to move to the country to get in touch with God. The fact is anyone who will continually acknowledge what's really going on in the world, that I have a big empty hole in me that if it doesn't get filled every day, multiple times a day, I'm dead, and that he is able to provide all my needs, and I'm gonna regularly go to him asking him to care for me, and he's gonna regularly do that, that'll put you in touch with the creator-creature distinction like nothing you ever saw before. That'll get you in touch with reality. So the greatest sin of the human soul is pride. We take God's gifts and act like his gifts are our accomplishments. We brag about what he hands out freely as if we had made it or created it. We brag about our wisdom, our power, our might, our position, our wealth, and all the food it can buy. And the Bible challenges us and says, what do you have that you did not receive. And why do you boast as if you did not receive us? And the Lord's prayer is just to make us in touch with reality. There is one gracious, independent God, and then there is lowly, finite me, and I don't go anywhere unless he actually answers my prayers on a daily basis. You want to destroy pride? Do it one meal at a time. Just just take a split second. I'm not advocating for any 20 minute devotional time before you eat. Any dads are like, let's just stop and think about this before we eat. Wrong idea, dads. 
Okay, eat, then think about what you ate. Or think briefly, just, just a split second. Look at this thing. Someone brought a cow off the farm, and here it is in front of us. And we have some friends over in Wisconsin. Their nectarines were shipped in this morning. And there are peas here from California. And all of this is God providing for us. Now, second virtue, and this has gripped my heart all week. The second virtue cultivated in our souls when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, is awe. And if you were to ask me what is the greatest need of the Christian church in our day, I'd tell you without a moment's hesitation, it's awe. Well, what about convictions on manhood and womanhood and all this kind of stuff? Oh yeah, we need all that. You don't get there without awe without reverence. Awe is reverence, it's joyful fear, it's a hallowing of God's name, and awe is often what's missing from Christianity in this generation. I find young people have a hard time really being gripped and controlled by biblical convictions in this generation but it's fundamentally because they're just ideas out there rather than ideas that flow from the awe they know about God. But when awe and reverence, listen to me, when awe and reverence are born in your soul, a thousand sins begin to die. When you begin to be get gripped by how great and how glorious God is, a stabilizing spine is formed in your soul that keeps you walking in His way. Awe and reverence of God kill anxiety and fear of man and grumbling and discontent. The soul that is in awe of God can rejoice in horrible circumstances and embrace convictions that might make them unpopular. And most importantly, they can marvel and rejoice in the glory of knowing God. Now, what's amazing though, is that God has chosen to cultivate awe in the human soul through Doritos. And if that's not holy enough for you, if that's not clean food, then, then he's gonna, communicate it to you through whatever you find uh, at Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck or wherever you like to go. <laughs> anyway, the, the reality is that these amazing gifts God gives us, whether it's Subway, McDonald's, Qdoba, Corrales, Aldi's, Costco, and if you're sitting there going, well, you haven't mentioned my favorite place, that just makes my point even stronger. All of these different gifts are paraded in front of us in such a way that we ought to be in awe of what we eat. I mean, it's just, it's, it's astounding. Can you believe the audacity that I have said this, and maybe you've said it too, I don't really see God answering my prayers. You ever said that? You're probably like eating ice cream while you did it. I don't really see God answering my prayers. Meanwhile, at the center of his main prayer, he says, pray about your food. And there we are, I don't really see him doing anything in my life. <laughs> Hand to mouth. And on top of that, in this culture, the facts are, most of the time, he is answering with insane creativity and generosity, I mean, where else do you find like Southern Thai fusion? <laughs> and even if you only ate Kraft macaroni and cheese or plain grits for 40 years, you would at least need to marvel at the consistency of the care and love of God to nourish you and care for you to this very hour. Let me give you a little illustration of this. Let's say a young woman was being pursued by a young man, let's just say. 
And each and every day, this guy was good, multiple times a day, he sent her gifts that were creative, delightful, thoughtful, useful, original, and consistent. I think that woman would be in awe. Amen? I mean, some of you ladies have been in awe and the guy like stumbles into a gift once a year. Like that was amazing. But I'm talking three times a day or, or if you're intermittent fasting, once a day really awesomely. In the window, he comes with your goodness. What's in front of us and what's put into us and sustaining us on a daily basis ought to make us worship. And some of you will be like, that was a nice illustration, Ryan, but you're going to have to give me a little more Bible to prove that. So let me give you a little more Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, there's a tithe, and I love this tithe. You could call it the feast tithe. Sometimes when I'm not preaching in Baptist churches, I call it the whiskey tithe, but that's another story. And the tithe was basically that you were supposed to take 10% of everything you made, take it down to Jerusalem, and you know what you're supposed to do with this 10% of everything you made? All your grain, all your grapes, all your wine, all your meat. You know what you're supposed to do with it? Wait for it. You were supposed to eat it. Can you imagine laying out 10% of all of your food in front of you and being under divine command that you were to eat this now before the Lord? Listen to the command. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year and before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose, that's Jerusalem, and make his name dwell there, that's Jerusalem, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock. Why? Why? Here's the text. That you may learn to fear the Lord. It was to produce awe in their souls. We tend to think of awe and fear and reverence only in terms of the judgment of God. And that's part of it. We should have a reverence and a fear for God because he's the judge of all the earth. But the greatest and most delightful source of reverence and awe is that he is an abundantly creative and generous and gracious giver. And nowhere is that seen more clearly than in Jesus Christ where the Lamb of God came down and sacrificed himself for sinners, not just to fill their bellies, but to satisfy their souls with the forgiveness of sins and with eternal life. His generosity is what's supposed to fill us and grip us with awe. And if you're finding your Christian life is just I'm here, there, and everywhere, and there's no unifying factor, and I'm just not really able to hold on to godly convictions in my life, I tell you what's missing is you're not in awe of God And you don't necessarily need to add anything to your life to get to awe of God. You just need to start paying attention to what's going in your mouth. Maybe stopping in the morning and saying, Lord, would you provide my daily bread? And then when it keeps coming throughout the day, every time you open that fridge, there it is again. Go over to a friend's house, more provision. Did this come in on a truck or a plane or a ship? Tell, where has it come from? This amazing bounty in front of me. I must have an amazing God. Why, I just asked him to keep me alive this morning. And here I am putting this in my mouth again today. This stuff is no joke. This is what creates humility and awe in the soul. Third point, it also creates gratitude. Gratitude. I mean, if I called you three times a day and said, I got a gift for you. I mean, even if I gave you like a nickel, you'd be like, that's pretty a neat guy. I mean, he calls me three times a day, gives me a nickel. It's starting to add up. <laughs> well, I'll say the same thing about you. What God's given you is starting to add up. 
right? He, he's, he's providing over and over to you. And there ought to be this sense in which it cultivates gratitude and thankfulness. Now let me tell you something about the human condition. When Christians talk about sin, a big part of what we're talking about when we talk about sin is we're talking about dishonoring God and being thankless towards God. Romans 1.21 says God created the world so we'd worship him. And it says, in spite of that, in spite of all the asparagus and all of the stake that God has given to humanity, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. That's our sin. We're not thankful. We do not honor or give thanks. Now catch this. The Lord's prayer is given by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one who gave us all these meals and wasn't thanked for any of them. And if you know how you feel when you give a kid one birthday present and they turn their nose up at it, if you know the the righteous indignation you feel in your soul for that, you are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who has not been thanked by anything he's given to humanity. And he gave it and he gave it and he gave it. And now he then came after all this thanklessness to give his whole life for us and to give himself on the cross and even give his own death for us so that we could be forgiven of all of our thanklessness. And now he is teaching us to pray and he's not just mentioning food because he likes to be relevant. He's setting the world to rights. He's restoring thankless souls into thankful souls who recognize that everything they depend on and get is a distinct, unique gift from God. And he's training them in the rhythm of the soul, which is please and thank you, please and thank you, please and thank you. That's to be our relationship to God. Lord, please, and then he gives it to us. Thank you, please, thank you, please, thank you. That's, That's to be the whole rhythm of our soul. And nowhere should there be more shouts than we take this Lord's Supper later. Because this is the meal that points to the ultimate meal, the meal that all meals point to. All the bread Jesus gives you ultimately points to the bread of life that takes away your sins. And we ought to walk forward to this meal later in the service going, please, 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 and walk back down the aisle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This meal ought to create gratitude. And you know what? Gratitude is uniquely positioned to deal with the two, two of the epidemics of our day. One of the epidemics of our day is depression. Here are more and more people being depressed, more and more people being medicated for depression, more and more people killing themselves out of depression. And it's very interesting, there's a whole school of psychology called positive psychology. Positive psychology doesn't study what's wrong with us, it studies what's What can we do that makes things right? Positive psychology makes all kinds of discoveries that Christians go, of course. Makes discoveries like this. If you get enough sleep, you won't tend to be depressed. If you spend time with people, it will mitigate depression. And one of the major discoveries of positive psychology is one of the depression killers is gratitude. But the hard part with that is that positive psychology is onto the answer, but they've got no one to be thankful to. And Christians are uniquely positioned to recognize everything I ever got was a gift. And so I'm not thanking the sky mother. I'm not thanking the, the world as it is. I'm not just cultivating a general spiritual thankfulness. My heavenly father put coffee in this cup and I praise his holy name. I almost brought a nectarine this morning just to eat it in front of you. (laughs) Because they're amazing. I mean, just juice balls that come out of tree branches. That's amazing. And they've got them down at Costco. It's crazy. You can go get some this afternoon. There's enough for everybody. (laughs) 
Gratitude will go a long way to destroy depression. Another thing that gratitude will do is it will fight porn. Gratitude will fight porn. And I hope that this church will never be a place where we make peace with the epidemic of porn in our day. Porn is a disease, it's a sin, it's a rebelliousness, it's a wickedness, it's a marriage destroyer, it is a worship destroyer. And twice in the scriptures, gratitude and lust are tied together. Twice. First, I've already read this passage, Romans 1, 21, they did not honor God's God, neither did they give, and he handed them over to adultery, lesbianism, homosexuality. You stop giving thanks to God, and you know what happens? You fall into an entitled envy. You fall into an entitled envy that wants other people's bodies to satisfy your soul. Now the other place this is mentioned in the scriptures is in Ephesians 5, 3, and 4. Now listen to this carefully. But sexual morality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish, nor crude joking, no dirty jokes, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Thankful people do not feel entitled to other people's naked bodies. Thankful people are content with what God has given them. And the root that would lead them into pornography and lust and sexual morality has been severed. And you can take a mighty battle against pornography, not just by gouging out your eye, that's important, not just by understanding the gospel, that's important, but three meals a day or two meals a day in that window or what on earth, you're eating somewhere. Looking at that food and going, this is a gift I don't deserve. Whether it's knockoff brand macaroni and cheese, still pretty good, or it's a filet mignon, you are getting what you do not deserve. And you do not need your, to live your life grasping for what you think you're entitled to. The fourth fruit of praying, give us this day our daily bread, is contentment. Contentment. Notice that the prayer is not, give us this day our daily filet mignon. That's often how it's answered. God often answers way beyond bread, but notice how he sets, notice where he levels the plank, where he lowers the bar. Give us this day our daily bread. And that's really the New Testament standard. What we need to live is enough to be content with. First Timothy 6, 8, If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Hebrews 13, and oh boy, Americans, we need this. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now you can't, if you take your standard of what it takes to meet, to be content from the personal affluence of the richest nation that's ever existed on God's great earth, you will always be discontent. Now don't get me wrong, I love the prosperity of this nation. We should pray for the prosperity of this nation. We should take part in it. We should work hard so that we have something to give. There's nothing wrong with riches well earned. But you can't make the super abundance of our day and age the standard of Christian contentment. You will always be miserable. Because you know what? There's always someone with more than you. There's always something you need. Sarah Groves has got this great song where she talks about how when she first got married, she was just happy to have her husband. Then she needed a sewing kit, 
Uh, then she needed home renovations, and then pretty soon she needed a painted walrus by a guy who made walruses out of driftwood with his feet or something like that. These niche items, that that's going to be the thing that satisfies my clamoring soul. We are call called to work hard with our own hands, but not just so we have more and more for ourselves, but so that we have something to give. Emmanuel, and I know some of you are too young to hear this, but I'll say it to the rest of you. If you've been around here five, 10, 20 years, you know what I'm saying is true. We are growing in prosperity. This is a church where many people cultivated hard work ethics in their early years, and now it's paying off. Not every time you can cultivate a hard work ethic and lose your job or lose your fortune for sure. But many have been given businesses, opportunities, investments that have flourished, promotions. And in all of this, we can't keep setting the bar of contentment one step beyond where we are. But we need to remember that we are to be content with what we have. And this brings me to my last point. The more we receive, the more God answers our prayer for daily bread, the more we should be growing in generosity. In generosity. Listen, every time you pray, your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And God keeps answering it, whether it's with ramen noodles or with the most gourmet pho you ever tasted. However God answers it, it's to create in you a greater sense that you could give like God. That you could give like God. God. Now what's amazing is when you get to the New Testament and you find these passages where Paul and others are calling people to give, you know what they often do right after they call people to give? They assure them that God can take care of them. Why don't we give? Because if I give, I won't have. And if I don't have, I might get left high and dry. And so the Apostle Paul and others come to us on a regular basis and tell us, Hey, if you're giving, God's got you. The Apostle Paul to the Philippians, after he's received a care package from them, he says, I am well supplied. You took care of me when I was in need. And then he says this, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Here's what, I, here's what I, if, you're, if you're considering a, a, a just increasing in generosity, you want to grow in your giving, but you sense this fear and you sense this sense that like if, if I give, I won't have enough. I just want you to think about it over breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Should I give? Should I give? Should I give? Just more, yeah, you should give. You're not going to get left high and dry in generosity. You're not going to be able to outgive God, who's been providing for you every step of the way throughout your life. And I'll tell you this if you're someone who you've been praying for years, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and He's given you hundreds of thousands or millions, or you got the thousand bucks, and then you got the three to six months set aside, and you even got some investments that are working together. The Bible's very clear. You have a greater responsibility to give more. You have a greater responsibility to give more. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Don't think you did this yourself. Don't think your hard work made this for you. You definitely worked hard. I'm sure you did. But there's plenty of people who worked hard and didn't wind up with hundreds of thousands or millions. And if you did work hard, you did it on fuel he supplied. So don't be haughty. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, 
but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. You are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. As God increases our prosperity, as we pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and he many times does that through increasing our prosperity, it's to increase our generosity. It's to increase our generosity. So what a wonderful prayer. Who would have thought that our bread was going to touch every dimension of our souls? Who would have thought that our food was going to lead us to humility and awe and gratitude and contentment and generosity? Only Jesus can do that with a sandwich. Only Jesus can do that through both prayer and the things that he gives to us. What a savior. Lord, we come before you, and we ask you to make us men and women of prayer. Yes, in seasons of prayer. Yes, in closets of prayer. But just in our everyday lives and moments, as we receive snacks and meals from you, would you cultivate in us humility, awe, gratitude, contentment, and generosity. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.